I've created a new document and by default, if I make a new document and you check out your swatches, these are the default pre-made color swatches that should always come up. Now, what color mode am I working in? CMYK, you can see it up there in the top of the name. If you ever need to swap out your color mode, you can always go to File, down to Color Mode, and you can easily swap it back over to RGB. Give it just a second. And then it will change it up that way. In Photoshop, you can actually have different, more different color modes to work with them. I'll stay with CMYK. The pre-made swatches will show up. You've got your solid colors. It will give you a few gradient colors and then a few pattern colors to work with. And there's also some pre-made um, folders of colors, little groups of colors that you can open up. Here's a cool thing to know. If you want more swatches, especially some pre-made color schemes that work really well, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, left-hand corner, click on it, here's some other things. So like food groups. If I want color swatches that look like ice cream, I can open those up. And here's some pre-made groups that I can choose from. Hey, there's chocolate and vanilla. Uh, if I wanted metals, so I can choose these, and these are metal type of colors. There's even gradations of color, and we'll talk more about these. There's metals of gradation, and I can choose those and start working with those. I'll keep, keep those off to the side. The other thing you can do with swatches, if you want to save a color that you've ever created, remember you can click on the bottom of your toolbox, double click. This will bring up my color picker. Choose whatever hue that you need and then your saturation and intensity. Check out the numbers that start to appear on the side. Do you see the RGB? Your computer interprets color by the number. And so this is the intensity of red, green, and blue on your screen. CMYK, however, is mixed in percentages. What do you think it means by a percentage? What do you mean by 67% cyan or 16% magenta? much of the colors in that. Okay, yeah. That, that's how much, that's the density of the color that's going to be dumped when it's printed off in the printer. The reason why different printers are so different is because they're calibrated. Not every printer can, uh, can be perfect every time, and so it's always going to be off on some of these colors just a little bit. But CMYK is always done in percentages. Uh, by the way, HSV, this is hue, saturation, and brightness. In my entire career, I've never had to set up something for HSB color, but it does come in handy if you to know that. If you pick a color that you like, you can say OK to it. Notice I've got it loaded up in my color swatch here. If I wanted to save that particular blue, the bottom right-hand corner, this is your new swatch. It'll give you a dialog box. It will ask you to give it a name. The name can be anything. It doesn't have to be the default CMYK value. So if I said... Uh, baby blue for this one. We do have a couple of different types. I'll get into global in just a second. You can tweak it from here. And if I say okay, I can add it now to my color swatch library and I can reuse this library or reuse this um, color over and over again. Let's make another one. We'll say I like that particular red. Also, check this out. I've got two little icons that are appearing beside my color picker. This is giving me a gamut warning. Remember I said RGB, your screen can make more colors than your printer can actually print? What this is telling me is that this bright, bright pink, if I hover over it, is out of gamut. The printer in CMYK can't print this, this particular pink. And if I click on it, it will move it to a close pink, something that the printer can handle. And so if that ever pops up and you want to be sure that your printer can handle it, choose that swatch over the other one, and it'll get as close as possible to that match. And if I say OK, we'll add that to my color swatches as well. Go away, libraries. I'm going to dock you over there. OK. Of course, when I start to use these, I can now start to make whatever object that I want. The next thing to know about swatches are what kind of swatch you're dealing with. If I ever wanted to change my colors on something, especially if I had multiple things created and my art director came to me and said, hey, we don't like that blue, we want to change it to a green. Well, if I open up the swatch, I can double click on it. I can change the green here, give it a specific color. 
Say they liked, eh, let's make it a little darker green. Say they liked that green. And we say okay. It changes the swatch, but every time I've used it, it's going to stay that blue that I originally had. Here's the way I can change my swatch to also change up my artwork. Let's make two new colors. In this case, I've got green already loaded. We'll say okay to that. I'm going to change it to a global color. Global simply indicates that every time I use it, it's going to look for that color all over my artwork. Check out what I have now on my swatch. I've got a little triangle at the bottom right corner of it. That means that it's a global swatch, whereas the other ones are not. Let's make another one for, uh, we'll make it that. Say OK. Whoops. When I save it up, we'll make this one a global. Now let's start to use them. So I'll use this global yellow and global green to make two things. Art director comes back to me and says, no, no, we want to use this blue so I can open up this swatch of green and whatever I change it to, especially if I turn on preview, you can see it will change up those colors as well. So if I don't like the yellow, I don't even have to have those swatches or objects selected. I can change those up and it will change up every instance of those. Make sense? And we'll say okay to that. You can erase swatches, so if you got them selected, hit the little trash can delete button. Are you sure? Sure. And you can get rid of those from there. The second thing to know about making colors is how to make and control gradients. These tend to be a little bit tricky, but once you kind of understand the basics, you're going to do a simple gradient on this sail. Let me show you some more advanced things you can create with it. So if I had a rectangle, any shape will do. It'll work inside of it. I've got my fill color on top. Next to the fill swatch at the bottom of it is my gradient swatch. And if I click on this little swatch, or this little mode, it'll automatically apply my default black and white gradation of color. In this case, in this case it's going from white to black on one side. There is a palette that's associated with changing and making gradients. I've got it open here. Let's drag it off. This will give me all my options that allows me to change and create these. First of all, there's two kinds of gradients. The default one is a linear, meaning it goes in a straight line from one edge to the other. The other kind is a radial. And this one goes radiates from a central point outward. I'll go back to linear. You can change the angle that it's going at. So instead of going left to right, say I wanted to go at a 45 degree angle, corner to the top, 90 degree angle, top to bottom, whatever. If I've got it selected, I can move the starting and stopping point of each one of these. So now you can see it'll actually change how that gradient will change up as well. And you can actually type in a specific location along your little gradient slider. Here's how to change a color in your gradient. Your gradient can have as many colors as it wants. If you double click on a swatch, it'll open up your color picker and I can choose my pre-made swatches and I can change that to say green or red or whatever I want. Let's do this one over here. Double click and we'll make that one blue. If I need to add colors, it's simply a matter of clicking anywhere below my swatch line. It'll add another little swatch to it then I can double click it to add whatever color that I need. And you can replace these wherever you want to place them. Change up the angle, change up whatever you need to work from there. If you need to erase it away, it's simply a matter of either clicking on the swatch and hitting the trash can or you can drag it off and it'll automatically take it away from there. As with any other swatches, you can save gradients too. If I click a new one, we'll give it a name and now it's actually saved and reusable in my swatches palette. So that's the basics of the gradient palette. Let me show you the tool that's associated with it. This one is what I use a lot more often. There is a tool. It looks like a little gradient uh, triangle in your toolbox. Yeah, there's nothing under it. When you click on it, it'll give you a gradient slider going along whatever object you have selected. I can actually click and drag and give it exactly the direction that I want it to go, starting and stopping point as well. I can even click outside of it and let it start somewhere else inside of my object. So this gradient tool is a lot better 
I can also click on the inside and change the position of each of the colors and how quickly they radiate with one another, move it around, that sort of thing. It really comes in handy if you're working with radial. With radial, I'll tell it the starting point and stopping point. I also have a way of controlling the size of it and the narrowness of it. Maybe even, let's see if it'll, if it'll work for me. I can change, yeah, the central point of it and do something more like that. You can have a lot of fun with it. You can get into a lot of trouble with it. Remember, whatever gradient that you create, you can always undo it and redo it, change up whatever you create for this one. What the book is going to ask you to do is to simply make a gradient swatch and then let it go across the sail this way. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's the final thing that I want you to be aware of when working in any Illustrator document is when you save your document. If you go to File and either Save, I'm going to do Save As since it's already saved, the book is going to ask you to make a PDF of this document. And when you turn in this project, you're going to be turning in two different documents. If you ever see in .ai, this is the native Illustrator format, .adobe Illustrator. Uh, you're going to turn in the AI file and the PDF that you're creating. The thing about using the native Illustrator file, it can only be opened if somebody else has Adobe Illustrator. So if you're sending it to a printer and they don't have Adobe Illustrator, they probably cannot open it up. They'll have to convert it or do something special with it. Specifically, they'll have to have the same version of it as well. Here's what I do if I have to send a vector file to somebody else. I like to use EPS. Don't be confused about Illustrator. EPS, Electronic Postscript, is a universal standard for most vector files. I can send anybody an EPS file, and if they have Corel Draw, if they've got Inkscape, if they've got any kind of other vector software, they should be able to open this up. My mom recently retired and she got a, uh, a fancy sewing machine. I can send her EPS files and she can actually sew out a pattern of a vector file. It works really, really cool. Okay, I'll just nerd out on those. Other types of formats. Yeah, there are templates. There's a PDF. PDF is another thing. You don't even have to have a vector software. If you've got Adobe Reader, you can save and open uh, PDFs from there. SVG, Shockwave Vector Graphic. These are used if you're using online uh, animation kind of, kind of uh, stuff. It is, a, again, a vector tool or a vector file, very low compression, but um, I only use those if I'm creating a website or something animated online. Let me show you Illustrator EPS. You select it. Notice it will change your file type. The second dialog box that pops up is arguably the most important one because this allows you to change the options for that file. The version that you're working in has a lot to do with who's opening it up. At home, Mr. Ivy only has Illustrator CS5 on his personal computer. If you sent me a newer version of an Illustrator file, a, a CC version or even CS6, I won't be able to open it up in my older version. Does that make sense? You can't go, it's not backwards compatible. Now, if I made a file and sent it to you, a newer version, you should be able to open it up. So if you ever need to send something to somebody and, they, uh, and you don't know what version they are, I usually save it as a really older version of Illustrator just to make sure that they can at least open it up from there. Most EPSs should work just fine to be able to open up your files uh, regardless of whatever you have. Newer versions of Illustrator will give you new features, but the version comes in handy. Also, other things like embedding your fonts. How many of you ever tried to open up a document? You made it on your computer, but you took it to somebody else's computer, and the fonts like changed on you? Has that ever happened? Especially in Word, or uh, it, it happens all the time in InDesign. If you embed your fonts, this will save a copy of whatever font that you're working on. So if you type something in Illustrator, you can open it up again on another computer that doesn't have that font, and you should be able to customize and change up your type from there. Those are some important things to do. Other little things I really don't play around with too much. Uh, I've never had to change the postscript level. But if you talk to a printer, they can tell you exactly how to set up your file to send it to them. Because most printers, if you send them a corrupt file, they're going to print you a corrupt file. They're not going to waste time trying to fix your, your project. That's up to you. Of course, if you say okay, it'll change it up. 
Here's what you're going to do. When you save a PDF, in this project PDF, here's the PDF options. I'll replace the one that I have. PDF gives you a lot more different kinds of options. PDF is meant for printing. You can change the compression rate. You can also turn on what are called your printer's marks. If something needs to be trimmed off or uh, it has bleed or it has color bars, those kinds of things. Your options are found on the left-hand side of your PDF maker. And there's also some predefined things. If I have to send something over the internet, I just automatically choose the smallest file size and it compresses everything really nicely from here. We hit save PDF, it'll compress it, save your PDF up, and that's what you'll turn in. Make sense? All cool? I want to give you the rest of this time to be able to work on this and work through this. The only thing tool I didn't cover was the little blob brush tool. That one's very simple to do, so if you have any issues with that, I can work with you one-on-one. -on -one. Okay.